Namaskar. Before I begin my discussion on Hegel, I would like to thank the authorities of Bengspuller Hoban for organizing such a course on German intellectual tradition. Uh, we all know the German intellectual tradition is very rich, very important, very significant, and it is full of many ideas. So we should know more and more about it, and we are happy that uh, Bengspuller Bhavan has organized this course for all of us. And I'm also thankful to the organizers, uh, the um, authorities of Bengspuller Bhavan, and especially professor, to Professor Shobhanyal Dr. Gupta for uh, inviting me to be associated with this course. But I'm uh, not sure whether I will be able to do justice to my ass assignment, for I'm not really a Hegel scholar. I'm interested in Hegel. I uh, have read Hegel quite a bit, but uh, Hegel is such a vast subject that we cannot say that we are uh, we know much about Hegel. But we try to understand Hegel. But I find Hegel is a very fascinating thinker. Uh, he is also a very controversial thinker because there are many supporters of Hegel and there are many critics of Hegel. So, uh, whether we support him or we criticize him, it is true that we cannot ignore Hegel. We have to study Hegel in order to understand the genesis of this postmodern philosophy and also many other uh, contemporary continental philosophical movements, uh, philosophical and also socio political, because I am especially mentioning to Marxism and existentialism, they are, all of you know, are greatly influenced by Hegelian ideas. I will come to the, those ideas later on, but first I will try to discuss the uh, basic structure of Hegel's social philosophy. Hegel, as you have already heard from Professor Sharkar, is a very important metaphysician, but uh, he is a supporter of objective idealism or absolute idealism. But it is, uh, we have to admit that besides metaphysics, he has contributed to many other realms of philosophy. Uh, 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 like Aristotle in the ancient period, he is the only thinker, I think, who has discussed about logic, philosophy, um, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, social philosophy, religion, history, and even science. So all the different branches of knowledge were discussed by Hegel in his uh, different works. And the phenomenology of spirit, which you have already discussed, is the preparation for all these works. It's very interesting that, thank you. Um, I, have, I have to apologize, but I have some difficulties with my throat. That's why sometimes I have to uh, uh, sip water <laughs> because of my, due to many other medications, I, my throat always gets dry. So, that is um, a difficulty. That's why I don't want to uh, take this assignment nowadays. But since Professor Dr. Gupta has insisted me, that's why I have become uh, I'm here today. So uh, uh, he has discussed many things. So it's not possible to discuss all these things in one class. But here, in particular, we will discuss about Hegel's philosophy of right. This is a major book on which he discussed about his social, political ideas. 
So we, our discussion, or my discussion, will be mainly concentrated on this Hegel's philosophy of right. Hmm. This philosophy of right is a book which he published in 1821, which he published in the 1021. Here he discussed his ideas about uh, social and political philosophies, but his interest in social and political philosophy started long back. Since his young age, he became interested in many social problems. Hmm? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, Hegel was born in 1770. It was. It, it's good that there is. You have seen this audio visual problem also. That's very good. Uh, so. He was born in 18, uh, 1770, and French Revolution broke in 1779, 1780, 1789 to 1799. These 10 years, we find the time of French Revolution. And naturally, as a young person, Hegel became very much interested in this revolution. He, along with some of his friends and fellow students organized a group where they were discussing about the impact of this French Revolution. And he became very interested in the ideas behind the French Revolution. And the French Revolution taught him one very important lesson, that the ideas of the people that can bring some change in the existing reality existing social circumstances. So social circumstances can be changed, can be modified, can be improved by the will or the, by the intention of the people as a whole. So that is a very important message he received from French Revolution. And then another thing he later on philosophized that these ideas which will bring about the change or the revolution that is not any particular persons or particular uh, uh, associations ideas. That should be the objective will. That, we, that should be the will of the people as a whole. So that he calls the objective will, or that he later on described as reason. So generally he uh, thought that French Revolution has taught Hegel, that reason can be laid to reality. Hmm. That reason is something which can be concretized, which can be materialized, which can bring over a drastic change in the society. That's why he felt uh, that French Revolution has taught him a great lesson. Then you all know the uh, basic principles of French Revolution, freedom, uh, equality, liberty, and fraternity. These are the ideas that were also uh, important to Hegel. And Hegel became very much interested in the conception of freedom. Hmm. So he later on uh, worked in detail about the freedom. I will discuss about this notion of freedom gradually. So what I wanted to suggest that since his young age, he was interested in this social problem. It is not that he was in, uh, interested only in abstract philosophizing or speculative thought only. He was also concerned with the social issues, political issues, even familial issues. All those practical problems of a day to life, they interested Hegel to a large extent. But what is interesting, that as a philosopher, basically, as a metaphysician, basically, he wanted to relate all these practical issues, social issues, with his meta basic metaphysical structures. Hmm. That is important. That he, uh, we have to see how he wanted to relate these social practical issues with his basic metaphysical ideas. And that is the scheme which he developed in his phenomenology of spirit. Um, though you have discussed about um, 
Hegel's metaphysics to a large extent, but I have to uh, mention a little bit about Hegel's metaphysics. Metaphysical aspect of Chikachavi, the end of to Jola Maki Kitty, I imagine. She tap Hegel's metaphysics. Uh, I have already written the basic structure of um, Hegel's metaphysics. Uh, that is, you have already started to know that Hegel is. As a, is a monist, he believed in the re, one reality, monist, and this ultimate reality or absolute reality he calls Geist. What is the meaning of this Geist? This Geist generally we translate as mind or spirit. So there are two different versions of Hegel's phenomenology of mind. One translation is one Hegel phenomenology of mind. And there is another translation of the same book as Phenomenality of the Spirit. Because spirit and mind, they are two related words. So uh, I have heard from my teacher, Professor Jain Mohanty, that the word Geist uh, has so many meanings in German language. The German dictionary has almost uh, 150 <coughs> different meanings of the word Geist. So we also find that all the different different meanings can be used and has already been used by uh, Hegel in his different writings. So uh, I shall go there and explain. Other physical objects 
and also from other sects that I am not table chair, etc. I am not X, Y, Z, this person. So I am different from all these. So in this way, we try to be self-conscious. So Hegel also thought that spirit wants to be self-conscious and in order to be self-conscious, it posits its objects. But these objects are not, in that sense, real. They are creations of this absolute spirit. It is positing some subjective spirit. They are the consciousness, mind, etc. And they are the objective spirit. Objective spirit covers the entire world, physical world, practical world. So these are the two uh, sides from which are actually created by positive by not created in the sense of uh, their actual creation, they're positive by absolute spirit. Uh, so sp uh, absolute spirit posits its opposite to know itself, know its own nature. When we discussed about the subjective spirit, I am not discussing here about subjective spirit. Because in this section of subject with it, Hegel discussed about anthropology, psychology, and other things. So they are under his discussion of subjective spirit. And in his discussion of objective spirit, he discussed about society, state, etc., practical problems. So the word, the, the, the discussions regarding to the practical world, they come under objective spirit and discussions concerning mind, consciousness and others, they are included in subjective spirit. So today we are concerned only with this structure of objective spirit. <coughs> this objective spirit also has a triadic structure. This also has been divided into three states. Well, this is the thesis, this is the antithesis, and this is the synthesis. The thesis is abstract right. What is abstract right? The German word is rest. Then we find that uh, 
abstract type is also using contract. I can engage the various types of contract with other persons. This contract must be lawful, and I have also the right to engage in contract with other types. So he has also discussed about the different types of contract with others, so I am not going into those details because then I will not be able to come to this important aspect of state and other things. So these are things what I wanted to mention that though he was a very abstract metaphysician, his writings are a bit abstruse in some books, but uh, he has discussed all the practical details of human life. So it is very important that being a metaphysician, being an epistemologist, he has also considered all these different practical problems of human life to such a detailed uh, study. So he has also have discussed about the wrongdoings, various types of wrongs, fraud, crime, etc. What are the different types of wrongdoings which we uh, will be face in the society and what would be the punishment, how the punishment should be discussed, what are the laws of the punishments, all these details he has discussed in his philosophy of right in detail. But what is the important thing is that this subjective morality, this is a very important concept. We do not call morality subjective morality or objective morality, we generally call morality. But Hegel has made a distinction between subjective morality and social morality. So he is the first thinker who thinks that morality can be understood from two different perspectives. One is morality is different to different individuals. Moral conception that may vary from individual to individual. So this is one thing which he th thinks that this we has to be understood that moral conception is not general, not universal like law or right. The law or right is universal, general, common, but the moral conception is not so general, not so universal. It is different to different individuals. Subjective morality is the same as the division 1, design and blame, division 2, intention and welfare. Intention and welfare, and then there is conscience. Because in this case, there is a triadic process of conscience. Conscience is the same as 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 the same. Private morality is the design and blame. We need to say that there is some plan of action. When we do some... I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. अच्छा बोशी बोली ना ना भी बोशी बोली ना ठीक है अच्छा ये सब्जेक्टिव मॉरलिटी कॉन्सेप्शन थे के ही गल आरेक चा कॉन्सेप्शन आर डेवलप कुछ चीज़ ये टा थिस उड़ी ही वांटेड टू कंबाइन द यूनिवर्सल एस्पेक्ट एंड द पर्टिकुलर एस्पेक्ट इन हिज कॉन्सेप्शन ऑफ सोशल मॉरलिटी Social morality concept, this is a completely new concept which we have received from Hegel 
and he this is he calls it Zitlischkeit. Hmm. Yeah, this is a German word Zitlischkeit. This is very difficult to translate the word into English. The German word die Zitte means custom. Hmm. So uh, it in many books it has been translated as custom based morality. Custom based morality or social morality. And he, here he thinks that uh, this is a, something which is general, which is common, which has both aspects. It has the common aspect, it has a particular aspect. Common aspect in the sense that it is used in the particular society as a whole. And this is particular also in the sense that it may differ to different society. All societies may not have the same social uh, norms or social values. So values or norms or moral conception may change from society to society. That's why it is also particular, it is also specific. So here he wanted to make a combination of both these aspects. He wanted to reconcile the universal aspect of law with the particular aspect of subjective morality in his conception of social morality. So this social morality conception is very important, very significant. And this is also uh, a, um, a concept which somehow distinguishes um, Hegel's morality from Kant's morality. You know this conception of morality that is central to Kant's philosophy, Kant's ethics. Kant was a philosopher who has given much importance to the notion of duty. You all know about categorical imperative of duty for duty's sake. So all these are very important. But Hegel has admitted the importance of Kant's contribution. He admitted that Hegel, uh, that Kant is a thinker who directed our attention to this importance of morality in the society, in a private life. So he has great respect for Kant in that way, but somehow he differed from uh, Kant also to some extent, and he thought that um, Kant's moral conception is not uh, is not uh, full of content. It is only discussing about certain. Um, universalizable principles, general principles, without having any content. So he thinks that there is no definite content. You know, we all know that duty for duty says we have to follow the duty. But what are the duties? They are not mentioned in Kantian <coughs> ethics. So Kantian ethics has given us only a formal approach, general approach. Hmm. So it is abstract and formal, Kantian uh, concept, but um, uh, Hegel wanted to give us some concrete examples of morality. Hmm. His conception of morality is much more concrete, much more abstract, much more uh, material. He gives some content to those moral principles. So that's why uh, he thinks that these moral principles, that these uh, ethical principles, these morals, these moral principles from which the word morality comes, it develops from our way of life. It generates from our way of life. So here he thinks that we sh should not only give certain universalizable principles, but we must also give certain content to those moral principles. So he thinks that uh, in that way, uh, Kant's uh, conception of morality was contentless, which he wanted to supplement. Then we think that uh, when Kant discussed about rational self, uh, he discussed about rational self, that this rational self is above society. This has no connection with society. It is, um, uh, it, it, it is a self which is in, uh, which is which can be understood apart from other individuals, but Hegel thinks that no individual can be understood apart from other individual. Society uh, is interconnected with human life. 
we cannot set ourselves apart from you know, society. Society is an integral part of life. So we see that uh, it's very interesting that Hegel being such an abstract metaphysician, he is also thinking that society, state, family, they are integrally connected with our life. We cannot separate ourselves from the social life. Moreover, you know, I want to distinction this distinction between Kant and Hegel. Kant conceives of self-determination as a freedom. What is Kant's conception of freedom? Kant's conception of freedom or self-determination is the power of reason over sensibility. He, want, he is being a rationalist, he wanted to give emphasis mostly on reason. So Hegel is also a rationalist, but his reason is much more concrete. Hmm. So he thinks that uh, we cannot make a distinction between our sensible nature, sense organs, sensible part, and reason. Hmm. We must try to focus our attention on the total human nature. So when he discussed about self, he discussed about self and duty cannot be separated from our inclination. So all these are important aspects of human life. Sensible part, our duties, our inclinations, our desires, all have to be taken into account according to Hegel. So Hegel thinks that there is no conflict between reason and sensibility. They should be harmonized. They are different, but they should be harmonized in human nature. We should try to understand the role of sensibility. We should try to understand the role of reason. And that's why he thinks that in this conception of social morality, he is discussing about all these possible things. So he thinks that uh, social morality conception social morality conception is a very important concept zitlish kaiter concept it is different from Private morality. Private morality is subjective, different to different individual. But social morality is whole. Social morality is complete. Uh, private morality may be regarded as, in the philosophical language, it may be regarded as an abstract universal. Mm. It has no content. That's why it's an abstract universal. Mm. It makes the individual prior to the whole. That individual is more important than the society. Hmm. But in Hegelian theory, we find that individual is not more important to the society. Society takes into account the interest of the individual. So it is Hegel's theory is more or less organic theory. You know, in an organic theory, there is a complementary relation between the whole and the part. Whole is dependent on the part. And the part is also dependent on the whole. Similarly, Hegel thinks that we are dependent on the society and society is also dependent on the individual. So we should not think that there is an antagonism between ourselves and the society. Rather, we should treat ourselves one with the society. So all these uh, in entire Hegelian philosophy, we find the importance of society, important of other persons, in, even in his discussion about family, where he also discussed about marriage, property, bringing up of the children, he discussed all these various things. When he discussed about family, he discussed about all these minute de details. Mm. He discussed about family. Family is a unit. Our moral conception develops from family. You know, I have written down that the notion of Zitlishkeit, a social morality, that has three different levels. The first level is family, and the other level is civil society, and the third level is state. So first we come to family. So he thinks that our moral conception, that 
generates that develops from the stage of family. From the family, we imbibe our moral conception. And what is family? The family, according to Hegel, is a unit. It is bound by the principle of love and affection that unites the different members. The members of the family may be three, or in members of the family may be 13. That doesn't matter. But family is a unit in the sense that they are all united by the bond of love or affection. So the main principle on which family is based is the principle of unity. Unity is the principle on which family should be based. Then he says, uh, then he discussed that family needs some property. Property is also necessary for maintenance of the property, for upbringing of the children for education of the children. So he has discussed all these details in great detail. What are the duties of the family? What are the functions that may be possible in the family? But actually, he has also a very realistic view. He, the, he also admits that this family gradually becomes disintegrated. From one family, we find the development of different families. That is quite possible that one family from one son gets married and brings another family. So he says that their disintegration of family is quite natural. And he thinks that there are different families. From one family, we find different families. And all these different families together, they must have some common relationship, the relationship of interdependence. So he thinks that society begins from the dissolution of different families, and all these different families are related by the relation of particular interest. One family cannot satisfy all the needs which we require. We require all the things, food, drink, shelter, all the things which we require, but we ourselves we cannot satisfy all these needs. Can we? We cannot do all these things. For supplying all these basic things, we have to depend on other, material, other uh, families, on the other parts of the society. So always we are dependent on other particular parts of the society. So he says that uh, society, just as family is based on the principle of unity, society is based on the principle of particularity. Why it is particularity? Particularity because particular families together constitute one society. And there is another important principle that particular needs are being fulfilled in the society. Society fulfilled all our demands, all our requirements. So that's why he thinks that uh, just as family is based on the principle of unity, Similarly, society is based on the principle of particularity. But he thinks that there is another institution which is based on the principle of universality, which combines this unity and particularity. So he calls it the state. State is an institution where we find the, um, both the aspects are being maintained. State, according to Hegel, is the highest institution where freedom is possible. So the ultimate aim, which I forgot to mention at the very beginning, that uh, this geist or this spirit, that the essence of this geist or spirit, according to Hegel, is freedom. He thinks that all the different stages, they are gradually trying to approximate freedom. So he thinks that in this, in this state, in this stage of Zitlishkeit or state, uh, this <coughs> freedom will be possible to, um, we, can, in, uh, we can exercise our freedom to a fullest extent only when we become member of a state political institution. So he thinks that either um, In uh, Hegel's um, social theory, he maintains that he, uh, um, in, in this state, state is uh, trying to harmonize the unity of the family 
and particularly the family with this um, with this um, uh, in, in, in in universal conception. So he, uh, from the writings of the um, from the writings of Hegel's uh, philosophy of right, we th we it's, uh, there are many passages. I have also uh, given you some passages of. Uh, there you mentioned that. Alive, the good endowed in self consciousness. Hey, it act of all our cotta, the army did a zitlish kite, but social morality bulletsy, she took a onic ethical life bullet uh, translate coring. Onic jaga, she tie onic both ethical right, polahaki in the army. Amar Munahaj is it with a zitlish kite, zite cotta, zite cotta custom. She is an Amar Munahaj, it's better to translate it as custom based morality or social morality the moral conception which is developed in society. So he thinks that the highest approximation of this social morality can be found in state. It is this, high, uh, this social morality expressed in family, it is also expressed in civil society, but the greatest manifestation of uh, this social morality or zitlish kite can be found only in state. So according to Hegel, state is the most important institution. You can may call it social institution or you may call it political institution. But he thinks that this is the most important institution. So uh, in many uh, writers that think that Hegel has given the rational, ethical justification of state that state according to him is a very important institution so yeah, state is to, uh, state has to be supported in all ways but we will discuss later on that these interpretation may vary there are some thinkers who think in a different way think, they think that this is not the proper interpretation of hegel what i want to suggest that um, uh, he thinks that um, The society, the private society, uh, the uh, ordinary society, he uh, calls its need-based society. And he, he, here he mentioned about different classes. The society is different. There are different classes, agricultural classes, business classes, administrative classes. All the different classes are in the society. But when these different classes are charged with universal interest, they fulfill the interest of the society as a whole. So he thinks that this is not done in any particular society. Only in a state we can find such universal interest can be fulfilled. That means only the state authorities can do justice to the interest of the people as a whole. They are not discussing about interest of any particular class, either business class or uh, uh, farmer class, but they will take into account the interest of the entire community, entire people, entire citizens. That's why he thinks that society, uh, state is, a, uh, is an institution which will give importance to the entire community, universal, and it has an universal aspect. And it wants to promote the freedom of the individuals. 
What is important thing is according to Hegel, Hegel thinks that the state is also a protector and preserver of human right. Human rights can be preserved, human freedom can be achieved only when we become member of a political institution. This is generally uh, different from our ordinary idea. Sometimes we think that when we become member of a political organization, our freedom is being curtailed to a large extent by certain laws, by certain principles, by certain uh, ideas of the um, administrative bodies. But Hegel is a thinker, who, Hegel is a person who thinks that that the freedom of the individual is being maintained when we become member of a political organization. So we find that um, he, he has described Hegel as the actuality of the ethical idea. State is the actuality of the ethical idea. What we mean by act actuality of the ethical idea? Ethical idea is a zittlish kind. He thinks that ethical idea or zittlish kind takes its concrete shape in the form of state. So he is trying to justify the existence of state because he thinks only in a state proper realization of freedom will be possible. Here freedom of one individual will not come into conflict with the freedom of other individual. State will maintain the interest of each and every individual. That's why everybody will be able to enjoy their freedom in a proper way. He thinks he has also uh, deified state to a large extent. He has also described the state is the march of God on earth. In one of his passages, he described state as a march of God and earth. So if we, uh, it, it may sound curious to our ears that why he said that it's a march of God and earth. But if we remember that God is a geist, God is same as spirit, then we will be able to understand that he thinks that the spirit or the ultimate reality that is expressed in the, in the form of state. The so state is the highest authority so far as the political philosophy or social philosophy is concerned. Hegel has import, give, uh, given importance to state. The state is the highest organization where we find the development of social morality, Zitlish kind. That's why I have said that uh, uh, in, the, in his political philosophy, we find that uh, state has the same position as God or reason or truth which is in the different other language. What he calls reason in his epistemology, what he calls God in his um, religion, theory of religion, he calls state in his theory of society. So in his social political philosophy, he has given state in such a high position. So he regards this is the ultimate position because there only our freedom will be possible. So one of the very important concepts of Hegel's political philosophy is the concept of freedom. Hmm. What do we mean by freedom? By freedom we mean autonomy and we can mean the right to determine our own activity. So self-determination and autonomy, they are the implications of freedom. Human freedom implies self-determination. I'm free to do, do whatever we like to do. So he thinks that this freedom will be possible in state. State will guarantee our freedom. State will give importance to my wishes. State will give, state will not deny our rights. State will give enough right so that we can enjoy our freedom. At the same time, state must have autonomy. It must have the power to govern. So he makes a distinction between, he makes uh, government is one institution, uh, one functionary body within state and thinks, thinks that government has the autonomy. Government has the sovereignty. It lies within government. 
And this government, he has also discussed about different forms of government, the princely power, republican power. He was not in favor of democratic power somehow. So though, though he was a champion of freedom, somehow he thought that democracy uh, will not work. That's why he thought that it's better to have a constitutional monarchy. Monarchy which is uh, which will abide by the constitution. So has, he has given importance to constitution. So every state must have a constitution. The constitution reflects the political consciousness of the people. What is constitution? Constitution is the reflection of our political consciousness. How how we think about society, what we want to have our, in our society. So these are being reflected in our constitution. So he thinks that the prince or the monarch, whoever may be, he has to abide by the constitution. So he is not in favor of absolute monarchy. He was always in support of constitutional monarchy, monarch who will follow the constitution. And whether this constitution is fixed or not, whether this constitution can be changed or not. Hmm. He thinks, uh, Hegel thinks that uh, sometimes constitution may be changed. It may have some amendments. We know uh, in our country also there are so many amendments of our constitution. So there are certain necessities which force us, which compel us to um, change the constitution. So Hegel also admitted the possibility of all these constitutional changes because this constitutional change will preserve the interests of the people. The, the changes are being made in order to protect the interest of the individual. Individual interest will be protected uh, by such changes of the society. So though the monarch has to abide by the constitution, the constitution sometimes may be amended. Sometimes it may become amended. So we find that uh, Hegel has uh, given importance to this constitutional monarchy. And he has discussed about also some international laws. <laughs> he mentioned that constitution is some internal law, but there are also some relation between different nations. He also, uh, he is very aware that Germany is not the only country. There are other nations, other countries. So there may be some laws which will try to guide the relationship between different states, different. So he has also made provision in his social philosophy for some international laws. So we find that uh, Hegel has discussed about all these laws, internal law, international law, all these details have been discussed in Hegel's philosophy of right. So what is, what is important that in Hegel's philosophy of right, though the language is very abstract, what are the content? The contents are very practical. He has discussed about all these very practical issues. So whatever you have heard in the first lecture, that his very abstract philosophy, his philosophy is very gentle. So my idea or my study of Hegel is completely different. He has also given importance to all the practical details of our human life. So in that way, he is a very comprehensive thinker. So he has, <laughs> he has given us an idea of the totality. So I would try to uh, bring your attention to one important aspect of Hegelian, uh, but all these important, uh, many aspects. One is the notion of alienation. He has discussed about alienation in a passing reference with reference to uh, property uh, here in his uh, philosophy of right. In his philosophy of right, he has discussed about the notion of alienation that I have the right to alienate my property. I can give away the property. In that sense, he has used the word alienation. But when I do, uh, discuss about this notion of alienation, I have to discuss it in a wider aspect. 
I don't know whether you have discussed in the first lecture, first card, uh, in his Phenomenology of Spirit, there is a section called Alienated Spirit. There is a section of Alienated Spirit, that is a very important section. What we mean by Alienated Spirit? Hmm. Even if I have to go there,
all that is rational is actual, and all that is actual is rational. That is one of the basic premise of Hegel's philosophy of life. He starts with this principle that all that is rational is actual, and all that is uh, actual is rational. So he is making both these aspects in the same way. He is giving importance to both actuality and rationality. So we find that this dictum of Hegel has been interpreted differently uh, by the Hegelians after the death of Hegel. I have discussed about, uh, uh, I, I was coming to the I don't want to discuss about this world history. History is not included in me. I can also discuss about one important thing of world history that he will may discuss because after this history is not discussed in philosophy of right. About history, he has given another book, Philosophy of History. He has written another book there. He has discussed history. But this history is somehow related with state because he thinks that this world history is also the report of how we achieve freedom. It is also the report of our gradual approximation of freedom, how we gradually become free. That is also the main point of uh, history. And history, he thinks there are three world historical stages. The first stage is a stage of uh, oriental despotism. He has mentioned about oriental despotism. And in this oriental state, only one person is free. The despot, one person is free. The others in the society, they could not exercise their freedom. So only one person was free in that state. Then in the Greek and Roman period, we find that only some persons are free. This is a republican form of government. So there are some people, they organize, they enjoy their freedom. But he thinks that it is only the German people who have truly realized that man as man is free. So he thinks that the freedom has been truly realized only in the German nation states. So this is his discussion in his theory of world history. So I am not discussing all these things, but I am trying to give you that uh, how this notion of alienation, which is a very important concept that has been received by his later thinkers. So what I was discussing that after the death, death of Hegel in 1831, 1831 he died, and then the he was a very important philosopher at that time. He was acclaimed as the British philosopher of Germany at that time, at that time. And many students, they flocked to Germany for studying under Hegel. Hegel had lost the number of followers by at that time. But, but we find that Hegel's basic philosophy, that all that is real is rational and all that is rational is real, that has been received in two different interpretations from two different groups of Hegelians. So Hegelians, after the death of Hegel, Hegelians diversified themselves into two groups. One are the right-wing Hegelians, another are the left-wing Hegelians. So right Hegelians, right Hegelians, who are the right Hegelians? Right Hegelians, they were mainly known as neo Hegelians. And what is interesting that these right Hegelians, they thought that Hegel is a very conservative thinker. He wanted to support state as a system, and he is the greatest supporter of state system. So the right Hegelians or the neo Hegelians, but you must remember that these neo Hegelians are mostly British. Bradley, Bosanke, Green, they are known as neo-Hegelians. They wanted to carry forward Hegel's idealism, uh, but they wanted to give importance to Hegel's social philosophy as the greatest justification of state. So he, they regard that he is a very conservative thinker. He wanted to give importance to state as a system. So he, they were supporters of state system. But the left Hegelians, who are mostly students of Hegel. Strauss, Bruno Bauer, all the 
other students of Hegel, they thought that it is different. There are different there, that this interpretation should not be accepted. We should try to interpret Hegel in a different way. So if we take into account the writings of Hegel, so far as philosophy of writings is concerned, if we only read the letters of the book, then we have to admit that Hegel has supported state system. But if we want to follow the spirit of Hegel, then we will find that Hegel is not a supporter of state system. Hegel wanted to improve the condition of the state. Hegel uh, wanted to improve the existing state system. How? The left, uh, the right wing, want, right wing Hegelians wanted to support the first half of the dictum. All that is real is rational. Anything, any state which is real, any government which is real, it must be regarded as rational. So, the first, uh, first half of the dictum, all that is actual is rational, has been supported by the right wing. Hegelians or the neo Hegelians. All that is actual is rational. So any actual state must be regarded as a rational state. But the left Hegelians or the young Hegelians, they wanted to maintain the opposite order. They wanted to support that Hegel had the intention of suggesting that all that is rational is actual. Only if a state or a society uh, is being admitted by the principle of rationality, then only if, it, if a state is rational, then only it can be regarded as actual, otherwise not. So they are interpreting Hegel in a different way. So we find that there is difference of interpretation of the Hegelian social philosophy, Hegel's social philosophy has been interpreted in two different ways by these young Hegelians, by the young Hegelians and the neo Hegelians. In the neo Hegelians, for example, by the Hegelians, from a neo Hegelians. And I would say the follow the young Hegelians.
alienation. Alienation can be found in our uh, mode of production, the system of production. We find but there is a difference between the product and the producer. There is a difference between the the product. No, no, to the round. produce an object but he is unable to use it. The product is given away to somebody else. So there is an elimination between the worker and the product of his labor. And even his labor in the society is being treated as a commodity. It is being bought and sold in a competitive market. So it is also treated as a commodity. So he thinks that in this way, and the commodity and the product is being sold to different person, the product cannot be enjoyed by the worker. So worker is not being able to use the uh, profit or the uh, benefit of the, pro uh, of the product. So in this way, Marx wanted to show, to show that the alienation is present in our economic realm. So what I wanted to suggest that this economic, this Alienation, notion of alienation is very significant. That's why it has been interpreted differently by different thinkers in the later period, in, the, uh, in a religious way, in a materialistic way, in a different way. So in this way, we find that Hegelian ideas have been carried over by different thinkers gradually, and they wanted to reinterpret Hegel dif different way. So if we really uh, follow the spirit of Hegel, that we, then we should think that he is, he is trying to improve the submission. That's why he was interested in French Revolution. The French Revolution suggested that we can change the reality, we can improve the condition. So that is the basic message he wanted to convey to us, that society or state can be improved, it must be based on the principle of rationality. Otherwise, any and every state should not be regarded as exact and actual or uh, proper. So I think that this is a message that we have to carry uh, forward. And that is uh, what is one interpretation. And I personally is more inclined to support the young Hegelian interpretation rather than new Hegelian interpretation. I don't know. There are uh, differences of opinion. I always feel that Hegel, though I feel in the uh, philosophy of right, he has given moral justification, rational justification of state system. But actually, I feel that uh, there is a contradiction in Hegelian theory. Hegel has supported this absolute state, the absolute spirit is static. But the process or the method by which this absolute spirit can be attained is dialectical. It is a method of conflict. So through conflict, you achieve the reality. So conflict or contradiction is necessary, important. So he wanted, to, in this way, he wanted to synthesize this thing. So he always maintained the thesis and antithesis, they are important steps, but they should be synthesized. They should, he maintained one. German word of Jehovah that should be lifted up, that should be transformed, that should be improved. So he wanted to ask, he wanted to accept the importance of thesis, the importance of antithesis, and the synthesis is much more developed than both thesis and antithesis. So contradiction is present in uh, contradiction is important in Hegelian system. That's why I think that this method of change, this method of transformation, that is in he that is implicitly present, tacitly present in Hegel's ideas. Though he apparently wanted to support state system, but implicitly he wanted to support the gradual improvement of the state system so that the state can be rational. The state can be moral. The state can be ethical. All right, I don't know I, whether I, I have been able to explain the basic structure of Hegel's political philosophy. Hegel is a very complicated thinker, but I have tried to understand it in, a, in my own way, in a simple way. So please, if we have any uh, question, please ask me. Uh, thank you.
Sometimes he thinks it as God, sometimes he calls it as reason, sometimes he calls it as morality, so, and sometimes he calls it as mind. So what is the exact meaning? So I do not know what, what is the exact meaning. I have already mentioned that uh, in the German dictionary, there are so many various usages of the term. It has been used in different ways, but what I feel that Hegel has his mind that this Geist is is something which has various dimensions, multiple dimensions. We can view it from when we uh, study his social and political philosophy. State, the word state is not the actual meaning of the word Geist, but state achieves the status of Geist. So far as the social philosophy is concerned, state occupies the highest position it is the approximation of the social morality of the sky, the greatest, uh, greatest explanation or basic exemplification of Sritlishkai can be found in the state. That's why he state thinks that state is achieving the status of Christ in the political philosophy. And the, similarly, in his religion, God is being treated as the highest authority and he thinks that God is like the Christ. So these are not the exact translation, but these, they are achieving the same status. This is the highest status. And the second question is, what is the freedom? How freedom can be realized in a state? State has certain laws and certain principles. If there is no such laws and principles, the right of individual, one individual may come into conflict with the right of another individual. When I exercise my right freely, without consideration about, without considering about the laws of the society or state, then my exercise of right may hamper your right. But state will try to protect the interest of each and every individual by maintaining a system of law and system, by maintaining a system of administration, he has also discussed about police, corporation, trade unions, all these details he has discussed about in state. There are so many things which are present. So through these functionaries, uh, functionaries administrative bodies, the state will try to uh, make sure that we can exercise our freedom and so that my freedom may not come into conflict with the freedom of the other individual. Everybody has equal right, everybody has equal freedom in a political organization. See, he thinks that state will be such an organization where everybody's interest, everybody's need will be protected. That's why he is trying to give importance to uh, freedom as an approximation of greatest approximation of freedom because he thinks that in the civil society there may be conflict of, between my freedom, my exercise of freedom and another's exercise of freedom. And that type of conflict can be overcome when we become member of a state according to Hegel. Hegel thinks so. 